at Mass one day, I heard the priest say, oh, you'll find your purpose through God and through the Bible. And that, that didn't sit well with me. And I would hear people say, you know, everyone has a meaning in their life. Yeah. Everything happens for a reason. And when I heard the priest say that, I sort of questioned it. I was like, well, what, what's the meaning of my life? Why am I here? So mm. sort of trying to seek connection within myself that I felt like I, you know, didn't really have. And it's a hard question to answer. <laughs> mm. But um, just when you're 12. Oh, definitely. It's harder questions <laughs> to answer as you grow older. So, you know, coming at it from at the inception of adolescence, you know, from 12 years old, uh, dealing with these existential questions about who am I, what am I doing here, what's my purpose, and then you have someone telling you, well, your purpose is to be found within a particular framework of belief, um, and you're trying to grapple with that as well. It makes perfect sense that you'd find it pretty difficult to wrap your head around as a 12-year-old. I mean, I, I didn't even try to grapple what he said. I just sort of just brushed it off because I was like, yeah. That's bullshit. Me being a curious kid, like I always ask questions that, and I was like, all right, well, okay. If I was dead, would anything actually change? Like if I wasn't here, mm -hmm. would anything be different around here? Do I actually add any value to others? If purpose is about contributing, do I actually play a role in society? I had my answer then being 12 years old. I had no job. Felt like I was taking up space because I lived at home. My parents and didn't really contribute. And so that meant, well, if I was gone and dead, nothing would actually be different or change. There'd be more space for someone else who had more meaning and purpose in their life. And ultimately, that means my life's meant nothing. My life means nothing and that I'm worthless. And those questions, they were daunting and they, oh, they're so heavy. And like I just tried changing the like, answer to those questions as well, but I felt like that was the only truth that was there. And I accepted that. That's fact. No one in my life would speak about when they were upset. They wouldn't speak about their emotions. They would always keep quiet and no one would address them. No one would approach them, ask, hey, is everything all right? Like, what's what's going on? I'm like, you don't seem like your normal self. No one addressed it. And so I didn't address it. But with these thoughts in my head, I looked at everyone else, especially at school, and they were all smiling, but I didn't feel that inside. That that really killed me, but I, I can't say anything. At least I thought I couldn't. It was just something I felt like I had to keep to myself. So this is halfway through the year like when I'm starting to have these thoughts. I'm decently popular. And yeah, I just fell into that, that belief. Did you, did you have anyone else that, that you had spoken about what was going on for you at the time? Not, not at the time. At the time, I kept it all to myself because I really felt like I couldn't speak to anyone. Though, you know, later on, I eventually like, started saying a little bit to some people. At the end of that year, I started actually getting into drugs. Mm. And that, I mean, like it, it wasn't like something I was actually looking for either. It sort of just came to me. I was, you know, hanging out with a friend that wasn't from school. He yep. lives near my grandparents, actually. And I slept over his place one night and I didn't see it coming, but he offered me to smoke some pot. My belief system at the time was, you know, drugs are bad. That's all I heard from school. And so that's what I believed. Mm. Though um, I ended up smoking that night because, you know, he's like, Matt, we'll mellow you out and make you feel good. And so at the back of my mind, I'm thinking, shit, well, that's, you know, that's the answer to my problems that I've had now for like, these last what, six months or so, I realized though when I was high, I was numb. There was no thought of, am I good enough? I'm worthless. Why the hell am I still here? And all this stuff. Like, I wasn't thinking that. And the next morning, I was just comparing myself to the night before, how I'd felt so quote unquote free, even though I wasn't, I thought I, I thought it was and how I wanted more of that. One thing that I had in my mind though, was I wasn't going to like share the drugs with anyone at my school. No one was going to know that I firstly smoked pot, but also wanted to continue on with drugs. There was one yep. girl in my grade who had smoked pot once and slept with a guy from another school and the whole grade, I mean, shunned her. It was horrible she ended up leaving that year mm -hmm. and like basically no one from school like ever like really spoke to her moving forward it was so bad yeah so you've got in that negative reinforcement there that if i bring this forward and, <sighs> and people know that i'm that i'm smoking then 
then this is what's happened to this person. What the hell is going to happen to me? Is that does that sound uh, similar to? Yeah, that's exactly what's going on in my mind and my family. I mean, my dad always told me if you ever touch drugs, I'll kill you. You kicked out of the house, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Being, <laughs> no, and like, like I understand like why he said that and everything, but um, yeah, I didn't want to obviously approach family about it, so I kept it all to myself. Though when I came home, it was just so heavy on my mind. I want to get more, and I was a skater. I loved riding my board, and I was um usually like at the time I would be gone for like a few hours. My parents wouldn't say anything because I was they just knew I was going for a skate. And I thought to myself, shit, I have an opportunity there to, you know, see if I can get, you know, find someone else, get on and, you know, yeah, get high again. And so I used that as an opportunity. I even I ventured pretty far outside of my house and um, came across someone and, you know, he, um, he ended up actually introducing me to Coke. And so I um, mm. initially was resistant, didn't want to do it, but, you know, he's like, what your first line's not going to kill you. Yeah, you know, I'll do it with you. I, 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 I'm like, okay, it must be that bad if he's going to do it as well. And I found a new love for that more so than the pot. And when I went back to him asking for more, he um, he said it's not for free. Being what 13 at the time, I have no no job, no income. So one way to make money at that time. And so I started selling for him. And I um, mm. yeah, that that was a interesting world in itself as well weed weed has a different effect on the body a hugely different effect on the body than coke does and you're already feeling down and out you have a low view of yourself of yourself you said earlier on that you were feeling worthless you had no one to talk with you were contemplating all this sort of stuff and what we did is it got you almost like a dissociative feeling like you were you were disconnected you were you were out you were numb and you just didn't have to deal with that anymore and then coke comes in and what coke does really well is it boosts your ego you think you can do anything you know you're just form <laughs> right there it's a, it's a diametrically opposed to any type of of weed or 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 other type of downers so coke coke does that yeah. for you it's not it's an ego fuel and so here you've got what you're dealing with from a from an existential point of view i'm shit i'm worthless i'm i'm bad you know all this sort of stuff and then coke's like nah man you're the bomb you can do whatever you want and and you're like oh i want that all right so how do i move forward to get that I'm going to do anything it takes to get my, get my hands on that sort of stuff again. And here you are selling for this guy. It just seemed like a no brainer, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm seriously upset with myself yet. I have a fix. I can get the fix, but I need to, you know, work for it. And man, you talk, talk about, you know, Coke being an ego boost, man, me and uh, that and skating, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I used to fly. So, you know, I started selling all that stuff. And anyways, four months into the whole drugs and all that, all that jazz, I met a girl at school who became my girlfriend. And this was something different because, you know, being a dealer, how I made my money most of the time was through, you know, parties and stuff. <laughs> the guy who I was working for, he would just bring me to parties and I would, you know, sell there and it became easy. And the girls I'd meet there, you know, yeah, it, it wasn't, how I say it, like meaningful. Then I met this girl. It really felt like something special. I didn't want to tell her about anything. Like still I've had the same beliefs, right? I don't want to open up about how I'm feeling. If I told her about the drugs, surely she'd leave me. She was the most innocent girl. And um, four months later, we both ended up at a party. This was the first time that like, I, I, I'd smoked weed with some of my mates at school. She knew I was high and she um, messaged me the next day. She said, yeah, Matt, why were you smoking pot? Then met up with her at school and I just told everything to her. I was like, Viv, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I was high, but it's not just not just the weed that night. I've been, you know, doing coke now for what eight months or so, and I've been dealing to keep it up. I haven't been doing it for no reason. I mean, I've been upset. I, I haven't told mm. anyone either. You're the first person I'm telling. And look, I've had thoughts of ending my own life. Like, I don't really want to be here anymore. I don't know why I'm still here, but hey, look, this makes me feel like someone. And, and she gave me like an ultimatum. Mm. She's like, Matt, take me or take the drugs. Like there's no in between. I can't have it in my life. It's toxic. To her face, I said, look, I'll, I'll leave the drugs. Don't worry. Like I want to stay with you. She did really mean something to me. It's funny because mm. someone can mean something to you, but then you have something in your life like coke or whatever drug or whatever vice you have 
And you'll make any excuse in the world why they're wrong and why you still need that advice. Because, yeah, it's in my head after that, I was just like fuming. I was so angry, you know. At the time, someone's giving you an an ultimatum of you either choose me or you choose the drugs, but the drugs is another person to you almost. It almost feels like this is basically it's yeah. a, it's a relationship that I'm, I'm engaged in. And this relationship has given me such a boost. This relationship is giving me uh, something that I can't get when I'm sober. And so it's like, you're presented with two people. It's like, choose me or choose her. And, and then you choose, you choose the person that you know is real who in this case was your, was your girlfriend at the time. But then it's like, well, I begin to resent the person that I've chosen because now they, they've gotten me to say no to this. I mean, uh, love in itself is exclusive. It says yes to one at the expense of all others. And that's the important, that's the important bit that that you're trying to negotiate. And you're what, 14 at the time, 13, 14. Uh, I'm about to turn 14, like almost. But yeah, it was yeah, yeah 13 and, still. And it's, well, presented with this as a 13-year-old, it's a big deal. And and you're raging through trying to make sense. And, and the emotional experiences uh, at that age are supercharged compared to when the brain tends to mature up in the mid to late uh, 20s. And that's the interesting bit, that your body is still trying to negotiate what's going on. And connect with that.